Who doesn't love a good ghost story? As you can imagine, the DMV is an area rich in history, and with that comes a lot of weird stories. These are the places that over the years, multiple people have claimed to see ghosts and experience things they just couldn't explain. First, I need a sip of coffee. I'm sorry, I'm falling asleep. Here are six places around the DMV where you can go if you're set on seeing ghosts and getting scared. First is Old Stone House. Built in 1765, Old Stone House is one of the oldest structures that's still standing in Washington, D.C. Over the years, it's been used as a home, a shop, and is now a museum managed by the National Park Service. It was preserved through the years due to the belief that Washington L'Enfant had used it in meetings for many years, and for many years had a sign on the front that said George Washington's headquarters. Turns out, that wasn't actually true. Over the years, several ghosts have been seen in the house. A woman in a brown dress, a blonde man in a blue jacket, and a woman in a rocking chair. Two men in colonial era clothing, a girl that likes to run up and down the stairs, women cooking in the kitchen, and a woman walking with a lantern at night have all been seen. <laughs> Children laughing and running have been heard all over the house, as well as the sounds of voices showing up in recordings that couldn't be heard by the people there. But one of the most well-known spirits is George, and he's known for being the worst. There have been multiple stories of him attacking people, and especially hating women, who he will attack first in groups if they enter his third floor bedroom. Visitors have claimed to experience an overwhelming feeling of dread while touring the house and inexplicable cold spots even in the middle of summer. Many believe this is George's presence telling them to get the hell out. Next up is Lafayette Plaza. Lafayette Plaza in DC has come to be known as Tragedy Square. It's been used as a graveyard, slave market, soldiers encampment, and the site of many duels, but one duel that it's best known for. I'm sure you're familiar with Francis Scott Key, or at least his work. Though the National Anthem was written in Baltimore, Francis actually lived in D.C. and served as the U.S. Attorney for D.C., as did eventually his son, Philip Burton Key, named after Francis' uncle. Philip was having an affair with a woman named Teresa Sickles, who was the wife of New York Congressman and friend Dan Sickles. It wasn't exactly a secret. Rumors have been spreading about the two, but Dan didn't know anything until receiving an anonymous note. On February 27th, 1859, a distraught Sickles confronted Key in Lafayette Square, across from the White House. After spotting him signaling to Teresa with a handkerchief, a method that had been used to arrange their clandestine meetings, in a fit of jealousy and rage, Sickles ran out and screamed, Key, you scoundrel, you have dishonored my home, you must die and then shot Key multiple times in broad daylight. Key was taken into the nearby Benjamin Ogle Taylor house, where he died shortly after. Sickles surrendered himself to the authorities and was put on trial for murder. The trial was a sensation, drawing intense public and media attention. Sickles' defense team argued that he was driven to temporary insanity by the discovery of his wife's affair, a defense that remarkably resulted in his acquittal. And this trial is often cited as the first successful use of temporary insanity defense in the United States. Many have claimed to see Key's ghost wandering the park looking for sickles, and in one story has said to have revealed himself in 1865 to Secretary of State William Seward to warn him of an upcoming assassination attempt. Just to the west is the Octagon House, designed as the winter home for John Taylor III and his family by William Thornton, who had also designed the Capitol building. In 1814, President Madison and his wife Dolly moved in after the White House had been burned, and also signed the Treaty of Ghent there, ending the War of 1812. The home had served a number of purposes over the years, and housed many people, until opening as a museum in 1970, and now is most famous for its hauntings, for which there are several. At the time, homes that also housed slaves would often have a system of bells to summon the slaves. In the mid-1800s, the bells in the Octagon House began ringing on their own. Written by Virginia Taylor Lewis, the granddaughter of John Taylor III, and I quote, the bells rang for a long time after my grandfather Taylor's death, and everyone said that the house was haunted. The wires were cut, they still rang. Our dining room servant would come upstairs and ask if anyone rang the bells, and no one had. Mary Clemmer Ames, a famous journalist of the time, claimed a priest had come to perform an exorcism, yet the bells did not stop. The bells have been removed from the house, and there have been no reports of their ringing since. Dolly Madison is said to haunt several buildings in D.C. During her time at the Octagon House, she was well known for hosting parties. According to legends, ghostly receptions are still held and Dolly can be seen in the front hall and drawing room. And when her ghost is near, there's a smell of lilacs. That's not so bad. In 1888, 12 men decide to spend the night in the house to prove all the ghost stories wrong. I'll just tell you about that experience in one of the men's own words. Quote, The hours were quietly on. The party were dispersed, from garret to cellar. At the hour of midnight, as I and two others were crossing the threshold of a room on the second floor, 
Three feminine shrieks rose from the center of the room. Aghast we stood. From all quarters the parties rushed, too brave to desert, yet cowardly at heart. We watched the gray light of morning dawn, and each man of us thanked God his night and among the ghosts was passed. After those screams, our band was closely knit together. Collectively, we listened through the waning hours of the night to clanking of sabers and trampling of footfalls. The Hay Adams Hotel. The Hay Adams Hotel was first opened in 1928, named after John Hay and Henry Adams. Where it stands was once a series of connected mansions where both men used to live. In 1885, Henry's wife, Marion, who went by Clover, fell into a deep depression after the death of her father. She took her own life by ingesting potassium cyanide a chemical used for developing film. It's said her ghost can be seen wandering the halls of the hotel, followed by the smell of almonds, which is the smell of potassium cyanide. The hotel is still open. You can go stay for a night and go ghost hunting. Gatsby's Tavern. Built in the 1700s, Gatsby's Tavern was once the center of social, political, and business life and hosted some of the most prominent figures in early American society, including Washington, Jefferson, and Lafayette. The tavern has witnessed pivotal moments in the making of our country. But Gadsby's Tavern holds more than just patriotic memories. It's also the heart of a centuries-old mystery, the tale of the female stranger. In 1816, a young woman and her husband, whose identities remain unknown, arrived at the tavern. The woman fell ill, and despite the care she received, she passed away in room number eight. Her husband, devastated, buried her in St. Paul's Cemetery under an engraved stone, but no name. He then vanished, leaving behind a tale of love, mystery, and a ghost story that endures to this day. Visitors and staff have reported eerie occurrences, sightings of a woman in period attire, unexplained sounds, and an overwhelming sense of sadness that some believe is the female stranger still wandering the halls of Gatsby's Tavern. The tavern is still in operation as a restaurant today. Go check it out and let me know if you see anything. Weems Bots. You might not know it by looking at it today, Dumfries used to be the second busiest port in the country to Boston. The town was fueled by trade. Mason Locke Weems decided to move there when he needed a change in his life. He purchased an old warehouse and ended up building a great life for himself as a biographer. He was actually George Washington's biographer, and is the one responsible for the cherry tree story we've all heard about. The second owner of the house was a well-known lawyer, Benjamin Botts, famous for defending Aaron Burr when he was on trial for treason. Now let's flash forward to 1869. This is where it gets dark. Richard Merchant bought the home for his family. He had a wife, Annie, and two daughters, Violet and Mammy. Mammy was unwell with what is now believed to have been epilepsy. Of course, it wasn't understood then like it is today, and was scary. Afraid of judgment for having a seizure in public, Mammy was locked up in the home for 23 years until she died of a seizure. Richard had passed away as well, so now Annie was alone in the house. Violet had moved away with her fiancé, but Annie demanded she come back to take care of her, which she did. Violet may have thought this would be short term, but her mom lived another 46 years. Neighbors said they could see Violet pacing around at night, you could hear loud sobs. The home was set to be demolished, but was saved for its historical value and was reopened as a museum in 1976. During the renovations is when the weird stuff started. It's a long list. A doorway was covered and a bookshelf was put up, but books would fly off the shelves across the room. Once the shelf was moved and the doorway reopened, it stopped happening. Sounds could be heard from upstairs where Mammy was kept locked up. Footsteps and screams have been heard. Curtains sway with no windows open. Pictures have been said to fall off the wall and found propped up in a chair. A window in Violet's bedroom will open and close by itself at night. There was a doll that would move around the home. There was one instance of a Boy Scout troop visiting the house. When they entered Mammy's room, a boy looked up at the corner of the room, began sweating, his face went pale, and he muttered, she needs her rocking chair and then ran out of the house in terror. Later, the museum manager confirmed with living relatives that Mammy would sit in her rocking chair looking out the window. 